My previous video walked through the details of my Black Scholes Merton option pricing model. In this video, I just want to specifically address a question that I think we get every year from candidates about the Black Scholes Merton option pricing model. And that is, you can see I've colored them here. Can we interpret N of D1 and N of D2? And the answer is yes, we can, especially N of D2. And we'll start by noticing that these are cumulative normal distribution functions. That means these are probabilities. They range from 0 to 100% in all cases. So my yellow cells in the worksheet as usual, these are inputs into the Black-Scholes-Merton. BSM is Black-Scholes-Merton. There are six inputs. I'm including the form of the model that incorporates dividend yields. Sometimes we first see the, the more basic form that does not include dividends. I'm also de-emphasizing the put call parity on this sheet. You may recall the previous video, I've mentioned that I'd like to include put call parity just as a reality check on the number. After all, Black Scholes Merton spits out for us in sort of a black box fashion what the price of the call and the put are. And put call parity is just a nice reality check to make sure that they're correct, right? It says that the call plus discounted cash needs to equal the price the price of a protective put. And you can see that's true here. I'm also de-emphasizing uh, D1 and D2, which are tedious, although we can access an intuition uh, on the D2. That's discussed in my forum. I think um, I've written a, a post in my forum where I show that it's actually not difficult to access the intuition of D2 in particular. So here for the price of the call option, I've unpacked some of the uh, variables here that go into the input. You can see here for these values, which I think match uh, John Holt 10th edition problem or example 15.9, not exactly sure, but I think they match. And you can see the call price here for these assumptions is $4.28. You can always do a gut check, right? We know the call price needs to be less than the stock price. That stock price is an upper bound, but it's going to be significantly less. as a, And we can look at it as a percentage, right? You can see I have about 10%. The price of the call is about 10% on the stock and strike price. And for a six-month option, that's an important input here. Six months, it's about right. It sounds about right. And the most important determinant here is going to be volatility. Okay, so what I have here is uh, for the formula of Back Scholes, N of D2, N of D1 and N of D2, and I've colored them to match. And I'm addressing here a question that we get frequently, which is, can we interpret the N of D1 and N of D2 Two in Black Scholes Merton, and I think you sort of can. The N of D2 is easier than the N of D1. But um, I've said before that my style, just in memorizing the formula, if you're going to sit for an exam, uh, FRM or CFA, I like to start, I like to think of this as the lower bound, and then we wrap in these probability functions, right? The lower bound of the call option is this current stock price minus the discounted strike price. Some have that memorized, some do not. Why is that? Well, we're in a risk-neutral world. You want to always keep that in mind. A lot of theory behind that, but we're in a risk-neutral world, which means that we expect the stock to grow at the risk-free rate, among other things. And if the stock were to grow at the risk-free rate, right, we compound continuously at the risk-free rate over the maturity. That's our continuous compounding. And then we would pay the strike price. The strike price does not grow. It's $40 here. It's constant or fixed, right? We would pay that. And you can, hopefully, this makes sense as the future gain on this call option if the stock grows at the risk-free rate. But we're in the risk-neutral world, so that's a reasonable assumption. That's the future gain. We would, we're computing a, pres a price, which is a present value, right? Price or value usually means present value. So we take that future gain and discount it at the risk-free rate, as you might expect. You see, if you distribute that, how these cancel, and we're back to right here, if I distribute, um, the minimum value. So 
that's the minimum value, or that was that wanted to give you intuition on of the minimum value as stock price minus discounted strike price. I sometimes call this uh, discounted cash because that's what's this is fixed, so we can think of it as cash that we're going to pay. The minimum value, and then we wrap in these probability functions. Why did I call them probability functions? Well, these this uh, n notation is we can just say uh, generically that signifies the cumulative normal distribution function, or specifically the standard normal cumulative distribution function. So right here, you can see on the upper or left, I'm using Excel's standard normal cumulative distribution function. By standard normal, I mean a normal with zero mean and variance, and therefore also volatile standard deviation of one. And what that means is we're getting a probability. By definition, this is a probability. So I I've taken to calling it a probability function. It needs to lie between 0 and 1, as these values always will. When the options get very in or out of the money, they will these will tend asymptotically to 0 and 1, but they are probabilities. So the less intuitive one is the N of D1, and it turns out that if we take this stock price and grow it at the risk-free rate in the risk-neutral world, this is the expected future stock price, is it not? However, this is a call option such that underwater outcomes will be worth zero. So it turns out that if we multiply n of this by n of d1, what we get is an expected future stock price. If the outcomes that are underwater are counted as zero. So it's a kind of average. And so that's my first term here. Well, again, that's future, so it'd be discounted back, and so this drops out. That's my first term here, stock price times N of D1, to adjust for that probability. But I've also inserted the dividend haircut. Right, the dividend haircut, you wouldn't see it in all forms, but as I've also covered in previous videos, in general, in option pricing, a dividend or dividend yield has the effect of reducing the current stock price. That's because an option holder foregoes the dividends. They miss out on those. And for a given assumption about total shareholder return, if there's more dividend, we would expect less Capital, capital or price appreciation. So you can see here, that's, um, that's the more difficult one, but we can view this here as a function of the expected future stock price where underwater outcomes are counted as zero because this N of D1 in, inter, introduces a probability multiplier. The more intuitive one is N of D2. Remember, I mentioned that the D2 itself has a very uh, intuitive way we can access it, but I'm not going to go into that now. Just to say that I'm just going to say that the N of D2 itself is the probability that this option will be exercised. It's that straightforward. If we think about the stock price starting here, there is a future probability distribution. And then here's the strike price, let's say, N of D2, right? Well, stock prices up here for this call option will be exercised if it expires in the money and will not be exercised if it expires worthlessly or out of the money. N of D2 here literally is the probability that this stock price will end up in the money. So it's the area under this curve as a percentage of the entire probability, which is 100%. So you can see here, and again, again, this is easy to miss or forget or just gloss over when studying all the numbers around the Black-Scholes. Again, I remind, N of D1 and N of D2 are probabilities. So when we see here, N of D2 is, well, very close to 70%, there's a very intuitive interpretation of this. It is 
that, again, here's the caveat, in the risk-neutral world, where we've made this assumption about the expected growth of risk-free rate, among other things, given the caveat of risk-neutral world, N of D2 as is 0.7 is 70% probability that this stock price will finish above the strike price, the op- that the option will be in the money, that the option will be exercised. Very intuitive, right? So that means this K is the fixed price that we, that's fixed, it doesn't change. We either pay that or we do not. We're multiplying that by the probability that we pay it. So this is the probability adjusted expected strike price payment, in fact. Very intuitive. So you can see in this way, we've taken the minimum value, which I started with, S sub zero, subtract the discounted cash, and we've just wrapped in the probability functions to account for the fact we don't know what's going to happen. Both of these terms are probability adjusted to account for what's the probability the stock price will be in the money in the case of this call. So obviously, the higher the stock price starts, the greater that probability. As this stock price goes up, N of D2, which is directly is the probability there'll be in the money, will go up as well. So I hope that is uh, helpful. I have on the second page in the in the sheet that I'll uh, make it make available for download. I add the put option here, and uh, logic is actually just very similar. If we consider starting at the stock price here, we do have positive drift. And then a not a very good distribution. And but then I'll just assume a fixed strike price here. Right. In the case of a put, now um, higher outcomes for the stock price, that implies that the option's out of the money, right? In the case of the put, it's only going to be in the money or exercised for these outcomes where the future stock price is lower. That's S sub T, right? These are out of the money, these are in the money for the put. And so, you know, I have the same parameters here. And recall we said NFD2 was a 70% probability that this call option will be exercised, meaning a 70% probability that will, will be up here. These are probabilities. It's one or the other, above or below. That means what we have here for N of negative D2 is 100% minus, 1 minus 0.7, or 100% minus the 70%. You can see we do, in fact, have here 30%. Right. If all the other assumptions are the same, if we had a 70% chance of the call option being exercised, we have a 30% chance right here of the put option being exercised. So N of negative D2, owing to the symmetry of the normal here, has also an intuitive explanation. The N of negative D1 is 0.25, and you can see it's here, a function of the N of D1. I don't think I mentioned in the previous video that N of D1 is also the options delta. So we say delta, right? That's change in the call price as a function of change in the stock price. Well, the put options delta is N of D1 minus 1. And in this case, it equal, that means it equals negative 0.2536. So the put options delta here is just this value that goes in the black shoals, but with a negative. So a little more, little more difficult on the uh, n of uh, the n of negative d1 input, but this is these are still probabilities. So I hope that's helpful. If you did like this video, subscribe to the channel, and we'll update you because I'm pretty much recording uh, two videos a week. Thank you.